when I when I was assigned this topic, I thought this must be a bloody joke, <laughs> uh, because I entered this field when it hardly even existed, and then you enjoyed the luxury of being able to, to jump around among all kinds of questions about entrepreneurship and from all kinds of uh, theoretical perspective and levels of analysis and and uh, methodological approaches and I did a lot of that and, and, and you could get away with it because there wasn't that much out there. Now it is absolutely essential to focus on something. Uh, but And then the other, the other jokeable thing about it is that when it comes to strategically planning your career, this is not a go-to a place. I mean, I just do stuff I find interesting. And, and, but then, in, in, in retrospect, we can make sense of this, right? And I do, I do have some, some streams. So, uh, as, as Alex said, small firm growth. This is, this is a pretty broad co topic, right? So it allows you to do different things. So small firm growth um, is one. Nascent entrepreneurship is one. So that is sort of the, the journey from non-existence to existence, which I think maybe is the, the core of uh, entrepreneurship proper. And I also have a stream on, on uh, uh, antecedents and, and consequences of, of regional level entrepreneurship, which is now dormant, but I, I did a lot of that in, in, the, in the 90s. Um, so if, if, um, if I am analytical about this, I think that, well, how do you do it? Well, first, identify a phenomenon or topic that obviously is important, uh, at least somewhat under research out there, um, and which you think is interesting. Otherwise, you will, will not be able to easily uh, stick to that, right? Um, do the homework. <laughs> I started my, my dissertation work reading absolutely everything that, that was tangentially <laughs> associated with, with, with small firm growth. And, um, <laughs> Which wasn't that much back in, back in the day, but it was across all kinds of disciplines. So, um, so and you you really know, need to know your stuff and, and convince yourself that 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 you're an expert. Otherwise, others won't won't, won't think you're an expert either. And read reflectively and uh, and uh, not just uh, accepting it as it is. Yeah, with a critical eye as well. I mean, you have this balance between uh, being being uh, appreciative of what has been done, but also. Uh, see the problems with, with the works. Uh, work with others. Uh, and if you have that expert status, then others are still going to start to come to you. Uh, doctor students under your supervision or, or colleagues that are on the same level or, or more senior would want to work with you uh, on those uh, on those topics. When you are into this um, area, identify the next missing piece that is a logical continuation of what you've already done. And then that becomes the, the next paper, the next project. Right? And uh, you learn a lot along this journey. So share your insights about the phenomenon and about the, the conceptual and methodological issues associated with researching this phenomenon. You needed to learn that anyway. So share those insights as well. And I've done that. Uh, that doesn't always... Uh, lead to, to journal publication, but it can become uh, book chapters, and, and, and some of them, in my case, have become uh, relatively well cited. So if I say a little bit more about my growth research. So the original insight I had back in the, oh, long ago, <laughs> <laughs> mid-80s, was that sort of all the theories, economic and business theories about firm growth, they took the willingness to grow for, for granted. And you only need to speak with a few uh, small business owner managers to realize that that is not necessarily the case. So the, this uh, issue of growth willingness was, was, was the problem, and that was the, the main thing in my, in my thesis. And it led to, to two... And the second after I, I, I saw that tension between... I thought, oh, this must have been done to death. But back then, it had not been done to death, so it was a relatively open field. Um, uh, so I, I got two JBV articles out of that that are reasonably well uh, cited, and then working with others, I, I I was lucky in my in the 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 early doctoral students that I got to en to engage with. So Frederick Delmar and uh, and Johan Micklund, they they both continued um, on on the same track, and they added missing pieces uh, where my my work was was very eclectic. Um, 
growing of uh, Frederick got more serious about the psychology part and delved deep, deeper into that. Um, uh, the sort of um, management strategy part uh, of, of it was, um, in, in my research, like a black box. So, so uh, Johan Wicklund, he focused uh, specifically on that or adding that element in still a relatively broad explanatory model. Of, so he, he put in, in particular entrepreneurial orientation um, into the mix. Now, back then, we didn't publish with our doctoral students. So this uh, led to publications by Delmar and, and, and Wicklund um, uh, separately. Uh, but they also uh, replicated a little, a little package of, of questions about the expected consequences of growth in their respective dissertation. So now we had data from three separate samples on the same issue uh, of, over um, a period of time. And that led to an ETP paper many years later in 2003. It was a Babson paper in 97 or something mm. like that. With, with Frederick, I then went into uh, researching high growth firms. And because there was such a hype about those high growth firms, and there, there comes the, the critical perspective, uh, in, in two, two respects. Uh, are they as important to the economy as, as it is believed? And uh, what, what are they? I mean, what are we really talking about here? So there, there is a, a JBV paper with Frederick Delmore and Bill Gartner in 2003 where we, say, we show that depending on which variables you base the definition on, uh, you, you, you find seven types of high growth firms, and they are, they are very different animals. Right? Um, and uh, yeah, and then the sh sharing insights about, about the conceptual and uh, methodological problem. Uh, Frederick published an article about uh, different measures of growth in '97, I think. Uh, Johan Wicklund, together with Dean Shepard, had a, a similar paper in, in the early early '90s, so 2005 or something like that. Uh, Johan and I wrote a book chapter about conceptual and empirical challenges in the study of of, of firm growth, and uh, which still is, is worth going to because, uh, and there are similar things in, in other areas. And go there and and uh, use that knowledge. Don't repeat the same mistakes. So, um, um, well, then then of course the, the field developed, and in order to stay in touch, uh, you need to familiarize yourself with 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 the literature more deeply again, and force yourself to do that for another reason that that you are or writing a dissertation. So uh, together with Lucia Naldi and Leon Achtenhagen, we, we reviewed uh, the literature, um, and that became a book chapter. It became a uh, Foundations and Trends volume, those 100 page thingies. Um, and that also led to the identification of the next uh, missing piece. right? So uh, as Alex, in parallel development, think also identified modes of growth rather than uh, just the volume of growth, that's an important topic that wasn't focused enough. And that there hadn't happened that much on the theory front since, since Penrose 59, right? So, so uh, uh, then the, the next three publications in this area was with, um, and now I had, I had this status, I, I didn't initiate any of those. So uh, with Galen Chandler, um, so he it took a theoretical angle on sales versus employment growth uh, based on uh, transaction costs economics perspective. That's in JBB 2009. Uh, with Andy Lockett, uh, we uh, reused the data set that was part of creating in the 1990s, which uniquely could distinguish between acquisition-based growth and organic growth, which is very important both practically in job creation terms and it was also theoretically uh, different phenomena, and from a management perspective, are different kinds of problems. Right? So um, we we have a paper in, in JMS in 2011 that Andy Lockett was the driver of, and Galen Chandler was the driver of the transaction cost paper. Lucia Naldi, who was one of my doctoral students, um, she looked specifically at uh, international versus domestic growth. So it was using the internationalizations theory and singling out entrepreneurial growth from from just growing with the market and, or being an, an order taker, right? So, uh, and that was from one a book chapter, uh, like 10 years earlier, 2002, we, 
we had I had reason to reflect on the relationship between, between growth and entrepreneurship. And that was in the early days of, of the strategic entrepreneurship movement. So there is a book vol volume by uh, Hidden Island. And so she focused then on entrepreneurial growth because that, that was sort of theoretically interesting. Then we should measure it that way as well and not include uh, any kind of growth. Yeah, so that was the growth uh, leg and the nascent leg. I, I may come back to, back to that a little bit as well. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to take a little bit of a different tack and not talk to you about my research stream per se. I'm just going to tell you the three pieces of advice I would share with you for developing a research stream. There's no test, so no works. I always do things in threes when I teach, and my students are like, which of these threes on the test? No, no test. <laughs> Your career is the test, okay? But I want to share with you that I think it's ironic that I get asked to talk about this because, as Pear said, I, I didn't plan my research stream. I am most known for my research on entrepreneurial passion, which had nothing to do with my dissertation whatsoever. In fact, my dissertation wasn't even about entrepreneurship. Yeah, I know, right? That's a little bit crazy, is it not? Yeah, so um, how the heck did I end up being known for this thing that I had no interest in as a doctoral student? When I sat where you are sitting right now, right now, a long time ago, I was still in school in the 80s when he was starting his research stream, so not quite that long ago, but close. It was the end of day two. We were all tired, a little bit punchy. Can anybody relate? Venkat, do you guys know the name Venkat? Okay. Venkat was then the editor-in-chief of JPB, and he was still attending conferences. He does not anymore. And he put out the challenge to us because it was in the 90s. And he said, what is the field of entrepreneurship? Which is a question that everybody's talked about for a really long time. We got silly, we got punchy at my table of people that had never met before the doctoral consortium, and we came out with this analogy of, of entrepreneurship to parenthood. Ben Cat was probably also tired and punchy and said, if you guys write that up well, I will publish it in JBB. And I went, woohoo, opportunity, let's go, <laughs> right? He didn't think we would do it. There was no way we were gonna back down from it. So we wrote a paper that ultimately was published in 2005. JVD used to have a really long cycle time. And it had the word in it, passion. Any of you ever read the Parenthood paper of JVD? Probably not. It's old. Okay, a couple of you. Um, if you look at that paper now, the word passion's in it. It isn't defined. It isn't explained. It is not about passion at all. But everybody cites that paper is where passion came from. It's not. But that's the first time that word was associated with my name. Because of that paper, I got into an argument with a senior colleague at my institution several years later about why entrepreneurs persist. Why do they keep beating their heads against the wall when they keep failing? And they know they're going to fail. Why do they keep persisting? And I said, it's passion. He said, passion is nonsense. That's not a real thing. It's not scientific. Move on. We argued, politely, professionally. And we said, let's go to the data. Let's go talk to entrepreneurs and figure out what they're talking about. Can you guess what they talked about? Passion. Yeah. And he was like, oh man, maybe there's something here. Let's dig in. Let's read the literature. And let's read everything we can get our hands on that uses the word passion. Not everything that uses the word passion. <laughs> <laughs> not everything. Everything academic. Anthropology, psychology, sociology, the passion of Christ. We were reading biblical stuff, right? We didn't go down that path, thank goodness. But think about the passion of entrepreneurs. Is there suffering involved? Yes. So it is relevant, right? So an argument, a dialogue, a debate led to a theory paper on passion. Continued dialogue, debate, conversation with other people about the phenomenon I was inherently curious about led to other publication. So number one piece of advice for you is do not try to figure out what's hot, what's trending, what other people put in the future research implications that somebody should do and jump on that. It's too late. What is it that gets you excited? What is it that keeps you up at night wondering? What is it that you're reading in your seminar courses that you say, that doesn't make any sense? They're missing the boat. Something's not, it just doesn't work for me. What is it that you are inherently curious about, confused about, concerned we're missing the reality of based on your experience? That's the research stream. What do you, I'm not gonna use the word, what are you jazzed about? It's not going to use the word passionate about. <laughs> what are you excited about? 
If you inherently are curious and you want the answers to the questions, that leads to a research dream. If somebody else says you should study X, that does not lead to a research dream because you're bored. And we now know from the research, people that are inherently curious and interested in what they're doing persevere longer, get through setbacks and trouble and bad feedback, and they have better success. Why? Because if you really like it, you're going to keep beating your head against the wall to get it done. So advice one, figure out what it is you're excited about. But along that, with that, who's great to solve? I didn't do my dissertation on it. I didn't even start studying passion until hmm, five years after I had finished my PhD. Be open to conversation. When somebody wants to argue with you, think about it. Let me ask you guys a question. In about an hour, you're going to get feedback on your own papers, right? How many of you are ready to defend the decisions you've made in that paper? And talk about why what you're doing is the right thing you've done. Awesome. How many of you are ready to get feedback on everything you've done wrong and how to make it better? That right there is called performance versus learning orientation. Right? I'm going to, my second piece of advice, to the extent that you can, be open to feedback, especially negative feedback. I do not mean in your dissertation defense. you got to defend. Defend. That's the point of defense in that. Right? But when you get feedback from senior colleagues, your same level colleagues, reviewers, editors, you have two choices. Get pissed off. We are going to do that anyway. Assume that they're idiots and don't know what they're talking about. Get over that and then think about maybe they're right. Maybe I didn't explain it well enough. Maybe I didn't find the literature piece that they just said I should have cited. Maybe they're jerks. I mean, sometimes that does happen. But often reviewers review because they want to be helpful. And they think they're being helpful. Take it with a grain of salt. That doesn't mean do everything that they say you should do. But it does mean be open to that feedback. Because that has led to more of my research stream. Something a reviewer said and was like, huh, interesting. Maybe not part of this particular paper, but wow, that would be cool to pursue for my next paper. One of the fun parts of our profession that you're going to find in about 10 years is people will start coming up to you at conferences after you publish something and go, it's a really cool piece. I was one of your reviewers. Did you have this happen to you? Carl, do you have this happen to you? Barry, do you have this happen to you? Yeah. Okay. So again, you could say, you were that jerk number two, weren't you? Because <laughs> <laughs> that, that had your demo all over it. Or you can say, you know what? You were really helpful on that paper, and you have this cool idea that we can pursue on that paper. Do you want to write with me on the next one? Let's, let's answer that question you wanted us to deal with. Ever thought about doing that, asking a reviewer to be a co-author? A little scary, but, but if you truly want to understand the phenomenon, if you truly are interested in what the heck is going on around whatever topic you're studying, then those ideas can take you in new directions that you didn't imagine, right? Lots of people have smart ideas, different perspectives on the phenomenon you're trying to study that can lead to really cool stuff. I'm now at the point in my career where people have really cool data sets. So they'll come to me and say, hey, that thing, I think I have data that might test this. Awesome. Let's work on that together. Let's go. All right. So being open to new experiences, feedback, instead of being only defensive, being open to that feedback. Why do you think there are a bunch of senior scholars coming to talk to you this afternoon about your why do you guys think they're coming? Say it. Intrinsic motivation. Yeah, they just are beating their heads against the wall too. Okay. Yeah, maybe. But why? What are they motivated to do? Yeah. Maybe they're interested in new ideas, like the new challenges, not the what everybody is saying, but PhD students who want to challenge everything. Absolutely. So you guys have the new cool ideas, right? Some of us old people have new cool ideas too sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I didn't say that. No, no, no. I got you. I got you. I'm a devil's advocate. It's okay. I just think um, um, ensuring or improving the state of the research as a whole, as a field. Yes. Yeah. We all want all of our research in the field to be better, to be stronger, to be interesting, to be relevant, to be exciting, to have good methodologies. And we're 
willing to invest our time to help everybody else do that. And while now your doc students in a couple of years, maybe in a year, you won't be. So you're going to start being the reviewers and the colleagues and the co-authors as everybody else is. Somebody said yesterday, um, do you guys know Matt Wood? Um, he's a JPB editor and somebody introduced him maybe here yesterday as a senior scholar. And he was like, I'm not a senior scholar, I just graduated. No, it's been like 10 years. So it happens really quickly. You guys will be here in five years talking. So we're all interested in helping one another because we're all in this together, really. So piece of advice number three, give back. I know that's crazy, your doc students. But productivity begets productivity. I am convinced I am a significantly better writer because I reviewed a lot early in my career. For conferences, once I was, had a few publications for journals, reviewing takes a lot of time, but the beauty of reviewing is exactly what you said. I can see the newest ideas coming out. I might have some input from having read it a little bit longer than those folks writing it, maybe, to help them think through their ideas a little bit better. It also helps you see what other people are doing wrong. You ever read a paper and you're like, wow, they really messed this up? And then you look at your own writing and you go, hey, I do the same thing they do. It can give you tips and tricks on your own writing style, the way that you present your work. So reviewing is a great thing to do. Friendly reviewing each other's papers is a great thing to do. You've got to be really careful of your time and protect your time, particularly early in your career, your tenure. But that investment of time in reading other people's research pays off in huge amounts, in my opinion. And that also helps you develop your research stream. Why? Because what do you think I get papers to review on? Passion, yeah. Or emotion or cognition or something in the micro OB space of entrepreneurship. I'm not getting firm growth. <laughs> I'm not, thank God. I'm not getting sustainability. I'm not getting a lot of the other things. Paris getting that kind of stuff, because that's what he knows. But it means I know what other people are asking and thinking about and can sort of project out, okay, they're asking this cool question, so I don't want to ask that question, I want to ask the next question. It just sparks what you're doing. And sometimes other people read the literature more closely than I do because it takes a lot of time to stay current in all the literature, and they'll have a citation in there that I'm like, I've never heard of this site, that's really cool, let me go read that paper. So my third piece of advice to develop your research stream is to review and get engaged and get involved. One of the smartest things I did early in my career was ran for a division office. I'm in the entrepreneurship division. I was division treasurer for six years. I'm not any longer. Why was that a smart thing? Because I got to hang out with people like Pear and Candy Brush and Howard Aldrich and lots of the other more senior folks. And not only, we weren't talking about research. We were talking about things involving running the division and consortium and things like this. But these are people that are role models to me, have always been, will always be. And so the opportunity to know them on a first name basis, to say hello, to ask them to friendly review, had an invitation to a conference this year from Pear because he knew who I was, not just the research I did. So these kinds of things of coming to conferences and staying engaged, however you can, are really important. They don't seem to have anything to do with your research, but they do. Because it's the same community of scholars. Same community of scholars. 